too long now. Let's, let's get to our scripture this morning. We're going to start with Matthew chapter 8. Because again, we're going through our series about who Jesus is. We're walking through Matthew and just learning about Jesus the King, King Jesus. Because Matthew does the most uh, talking and reference, referencing and mm, talking to about Jesus and his and his majesty, his, his royalty, who he is, and what it means to us. So we're just gonna walk through that. Jesus is the one that came down from heaven. He left. Being worshipped. He left just being resting within the, the bosom of the Father. He left all of that and came down and put on flesh. Flesh that he would have to subdue. Flesh that he would have to uh, bring into subjection and contend with. Heavenly royalty came down and put on flesh. Heavenly royalty came down earth so that we can have relationship again with God as our Heavenly Father. The power to go so that we would go from being creation of the tree. So that we would go from hanging out in a garden to indwelling the Holy Spirit. Manifest Holy Spirit. God just wanted that connection, that unbreakable connection. week we talked about the presentation of the king, the birth of Jesus, the coming of John the Baptist, the forerunner, his advent and his, the announcing of him and his approval. Last week we talked about the proclamation of the king. And it was the Sermon on the Mount. Just did the background, did the Sermon on the Mount, and everything that Jesus came in and laid out. He basically told us how, to, how we ought to behave ourselves as Christians. He told us how what to do if we want to be blessed by God. If we want to be blessed. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the humble in spirit. Blessed are those I'm just butchering all that up. But it's Matthew chapter 5. Read it. The, ble the Beatitudes. The blessing. The blessing of the Lord. And it's, and it's apostles. It's not a list of people. Well, blessed are the peacemakers. Well, I'm the peacemaker. Blessed are the peacemakers. No. When you read through the uh, through the Beatitudes, you'll see that it's a it's a progression, a progression that we go through as a believer. That we go through to, to walk through. And this week we're gonna talk about it's the power of the king. <laughs> He's presented, he begins his proclamations, he begins his the, the declaration of preaching of his ministry and everything. Now it's the the power of the king. And we're starting in Matthew chapter 8, verse 1. We're going to actually go through Matthew chapter 11 in verse 1. But the first segment, under the power of the king, part 3, Matthew chapter 8, verse 1, through Matthew chapter 9, verse 34, the demonstrations of the king's power. The demonstrations of the king's power. Again, like we read in, in chapter 8, verses 1 through 4, it talks about the, the, the healing, the cleansing of the leper. 1 through 17 talks about the, the healing that Jesus uh, that carried out. 1 through 4 is the, the cleansing of the leper. 5 through 13, the centurion's servant is healed. 14 through 17, Peter's mother-in-law is healed. So, he's demonstrating his power through 
healing people. Whatever affliction, whatever disease, whatever sickness, he's healing sicknesses. In different venues, he's healing the leper. Lepers who, uh, once they contracted leprosy, once it's confirmed that they had leprosy, had to live outside of normal society. They couldn't come back to live. They had to, they had to go to the colonies. They, couldn't, they couldn't come back at, at the risk of their own lives. And caught within the bounds of the city, as a leper, you could be stoned to death. So the healing of the leper giving them back a regular life. Now they can go back <laughs> with friends and family. Now they can go back with their loved ones. They're healed. The centurion's servant, that was a great demonstration of faith on the part of the centurion. He's like, look, <laughs> I just, all you need to do is speak. You're a man of authority. I'm a man of authority as a centurion. You are a man of authority. I know all you need to do is speak and it will be done. Faith. Faith. He demonstrated his faith. Faith. That, that, that faith brought about the opportunity for him to be yeah, healed. Peter's mother-in-law was healed. And the miracle was healed. So after we talked about after he talks about after Matthew the author he talks about the healing he moves into the next section under the demonstration of the king's power the demonstration of the king's power we've going to move to ch uh, chapter 8 verses 18 through 22 now and in verses 18 through 22 following up Jesus he, he has demonstrated the king has demonstrated his power through the miracles of healing now he's going to talk about the demands of discipleship in 18 through 22 I'm going to read through that just briefly from the New International Version it says when Jesus saw the crowd around him he gave orders to cross over to the other side of the lake then the teacher of the law came to him and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus replied, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. And another disciple said to him, First, let me go and bury my father. But Jesus told him, Follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. The cost of following Jesus. This seems, this seems pretty harsh. To read it on the surface, when you say that somebody he just he just lost his father. First, let me go bury my father. My my father has passed away. But before I can follow you, let me go bury my father. And Jesus is saying, "Follow me and let the dead bury their own dead." We talked about this before in a, a, a previous message where. This person is saying, I'll follow you, but I have to take care of family affairs first. I have to take care of family first. This, <laughs> don't, don't get this twisted. Don't let this sound wrong. But he's already demonstrated that he's going to allow other things to come before him following Jesus. Follow me. I will follow you. The one guy says, I will follow you. And then this guy says, I will follow you too. But first, let me go take care of this. I'll follow you too. But I got to do this first. I got to take care of my, I got to take care of these affairs first. And Jesus clearly says, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. Jesus is saying, he's telling him that, no, he's not saying that it's unimportant what your father has to do. He didn't say that. He's not saying that, uh, you know, just, just forget about your family. He's not telling him that because God established that. Because God established, he, spent, he established family in the Old Testament, in the, in the, in, in the garden where he, he put Adam and Eve. And they began to have children. They had Cain, they had Abel, they had Seth. They had the rest of the Adam and Eve clan. 
So God's not saying to get a master's degree. He's not saying that thing. What he's saying is, I have to be the first. If you say you're going to follow me, follow me. Don't let anything else get in the way of following me. And that just lets you know how serious it is. This is not a parable. <laughs> this, is, this is an account. This is an actual account. Follow me and let the dead bury their own. Don't be concerned. any positivity about it. He just says, follow me. He just says, follow me. So he lets people know about what the demands of discipleship are. The first section, he has demonstrated miracles of healing. After the miracles of healing, he says what the demands of discipleship are. After the miracles of healing, after the demands of discipleship, now he comes to the miracles of power themselves. The miracles of power themselves. How did he demonstrate his power? How does he demonstrate the miracles of power? First of all, from Matthew chapter 8, verse 23, to chapter 9, verse 8, two accounts. Three accounts, if you will. First, he calms the sea. Verses 23 through 27. Chapter 8, verses 23 through 27. And when they got into the boat, and his disciples followed him, without warning, a furious storm came up on the lake, so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. <laughs> And the disciples woke him up saying, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. And he replied, oh, you of little faith. <laughs> Why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. And the men were amazed and said, what kind of man is this? Even the waves, even the winds and the waves obey him, demonstrating his power with the miracle of power. We've never seen this before. Somebody speak to a storm and the storm sits down and is still. <laughs> we see it as we count it as a miracle when, a, when, a, when, when one of our children is misbehaving. <laughs> and we just say, sit down and be still. And they, to us, that's a miracle right there. <laughs> well, what manner of man am I <laughs> that I can still this run ruly child? <laughs> you know? But, but here it is, Jesus himself has calmed a storm with the word. Bring your peace be still. He rebuked the storm. He, ah, peace be still. Calm waters. Calm waters. Jesus was asleep during the storm. All chaos was breaking loose out there. <laughs> they were fearing for their lives. Jesus is knocked out. He's crashing in the boat. <laughs> now, they, didn't, they weren't on a luxury liner. They weren't on a, a, a super, super duper yacht. They were on something they, that they were in fear of. Sinking. <laughs> but Jesus was asleep. Jesus hadn't said, let's go over to the other side. He said, let's go over to the other side. And it's most founded from uh, in one of the other Gospels. Read it for yourself. Let's go over to the other side. But they left what was actually going on, the pitching of the boat. They left the, 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 the storm. Why are you afraid? 
we all would look at it and say, that's really not, that's not fair, Jesus, because the, the storm was raging. The storm was raging. That's not fair, Jesus, because the, everything was coming into the boat, and it looked like we were going to, we were going to die. It looked like, it appeared that way. us know that no matter how the storm rages around us, that lets us know that no matter what it looks like, that lets us know that even in the deepest, darkest part of the storm, Jesus has us. He has us. He has us. Even though it might look like, feel like, seem that he is asleep, he has us. He has us. And what is it about Jesus? He was asleep, and to them, he didn't know what was going on. So they had to bring him up and wake him up and make him aware that we're about to lose our lives. They, they, they didn't <laughs> don't know if they they didn't when they woke him up, they didn't expect him to calm the to storm because they were surprised when he did. But they were just afraid. But they were just afraid because if they had any inkling that he could calm the storm, then they wouldn't have then they wouldn't have had to fear the storm. Because if you know that something is coming at you, but you have the antidote, you have the answer for it, then you don't fear what's coming. Jesus said, woe is me, little faith. Why are you afraid? Keep rebuke the storm. Keep the boat. That's what all these people sat down and they were still. Then they get to the other side of the lake. Verses 28-34. When they arrived at the other side, in the regions of the Gadarenes, two demon-possessed men coming off the tombs met him, and they were so violent that no one could pass that way. What do you want with us, son of God? They shouted. Have you come? Have you come here to torture us? Before the time? See, they're demons. They, they know what the time scale is. They know, they know what's going to happen. They know what the future entails. They know what their end is. But that doesn't stop them from, from trying to carry out and, and, and wreak as much havoc as they can before they go. Have you come to torture us before the time? Verse 30 says, at some distance from them, a large herd of pigs was feeding, and the demons begged Jesus, if you drive us out, send us into the herd of pigs. And he said to them, go. <laughs> so they came out and went into the pigs, and the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and died in the water. And those ten of the pigs <laughs> ran off and went to the town and reported all of this, including what had happened to the two demons town went out to meet Jesus and when they saw him they feared with him to leave their region. Wow. <laughs> Two demon possessed men like that. <laughs> and they come out and they, they ask Jesus to leave their region. Why did they ask Jesus to leave the region? <laughs> because these were these were Israelites. They, they weren't supposed to have a pig farm. <laughs> they weren't supposed to be keeping pigs. They weren't supposed to be uh, they, they weren't supposed to. So when these two demon-possessed men, when Jesus goes to heal them, they ask if they can go into the swine. He's like, okay. They're not supposed to have any of them. But he said, yeah, go ahead and go. Go ahead and go into the swine. The swine go. They told him everything. <laughs> told him the two demon-possessed men were healed. <laughs> were delivered. And their great concern was, demonstrated his power over nature. He's demonstrated his power over the enemy. He's demonstrated his power over, over demons. In the spirit world, he's demonstrated his power. He's, 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 he's letting people know. So word is spreading. Word is spreading now. The word of healing, the miracle of healing, that word is spreading. The miracle of his power. He calmed the sea. He, he, he healed the demon-possessed men. Now we move into the chapter 9, verse 1 through 8. Jesus 
that Indra wrote and crossed over and came to his own town. Some men brought to him a paralytic lying on a mat. When Jesus <coughs> saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, <laughs> Take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. And at this, some of the teachers of the law said to themselves, This fellow is blaspheming. Knowing their thoughts, Jesus said, Why do you entertain evil thoughts in your heart? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk? <laughs> but so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority <laughs> to forgive on earth to forgive sins. <laughs> then he said to the paralytic, get up and take your mat and go home. And the man got up and went home. And the crowd saw this, and they were filled with awe. And they praised God, <laughs> who had given such authority to men. Doesn't, he doesn't defend himself in this passage. He sees the faith of the men who brought the paralytic to, Jesus, to him. <laughs> the faith of the men who brought the paralytic to him impressed Jesus so much that he said, you know what? <laughs> Your sins are forgiven. He didn't even, hadn't even thought to heal it, the man yet. He says, you know what? Their faith was so great that they brought you to me as a paralytic, not only having heard, not having seen, but only having heard, your sins are forgiven. He forgives the man's sins. That is the greater, that was the greater need. He didn't heal the paralytic right there. He said, your sins are forgiven. He healed, he, he, he got to what the root of the man's problem was. But then, when he's challenged by those who are around, oh, look at you, Mr. Mr. Special Guy. You, you can forgive sins. Who, who gave you the authority to forgive sins? Oh, so that you know that I have authority from heaven to forgive sins? Get up and walk, too. Get up and walk, too. He got a bonus. <laughs> so the paralytic got a bonus because stiff-necked, hard-headed people coming around wanting to challenge Jesus. So he got a bonus. And here we go again. Get up, take your mat, and go home. The man got up and went home. He didn't ask any questions. He didn't stand up. Well, how'd you do that? Well, well my goodness. He got up and went home. <laughs> he did what he was told to do. He got up and went home. And then the crowd that saw, the crowd that saw, they were filled with awe. And they praised God who had given such authority to men. Why do we, why do we get challenged the way we do sometimes? Why do we get challenged the way we do? So that God can demonstrate his power before men. And that when those men, when those people see God demonstrate and manifest his power through us, that those who are around, that those who are around, when the crowd saw this, they were filled with awe. So that the crowd who's standing around watching somebody challenge us, when God manifests well, that crowd will be filled with awe, and they will see, and they will praise God who has given such authority to men. Why do we go through the things that we go through sometimes? Why do we get challenged the way we do? So that the crowd will see, so that somebody will see, and then God will get the glory. And they will praise God for putting such authority. Miracles of healing. Jesus talks about the demands of discipleship. We have the miracles of power. Chapter 9, verses 9 through 17. The distinctions of the disciples. The distinction of the disciples. Matthew chapter 9, verse 9, he calls Matthew. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. Matthew was a tax collector. Tax collectors were known to be the shadiest <laughs> people around, the least honest people around. Same time, some of 
the richest people on earth. Why? Because if the tax was 10, 10 talents, <laughs> they charged you 12. They were keeping 10 for themselves. And more than likely it was worse than that simply because these were some really, really affluent people, tax collectors. When Jesus, messed, when, when Jesus invited himself to Zacchaeus' house, Zacchaeus spent time with Jesus. And Zacchaeus, he came into the revelation that he had not lived right, that he had to make amends for what he did. So he, he gave back. He gave back. He returned some of the people of the, 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 the ill-gotten gain that he had come into by being a, an unscrupulous tax collector. So Jesus, the 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 of the lowest, of the most lowly looked upon profession. This is the first one we have record of Jesus calling. He didn't go to the temple. He didn't go to the synagogue. He didn't find the most knowledgeable priest. He didn't find the, the best teacher. He didn't find the most articulate scribe. He didn't go to the religious establishment. As he was walking in, as he was walking, as Jesus went on from there, he saw a man sitting there, a tax collector, with him. And the tax collector who was sitting there, Jesus said, follow me. Follow me. He didn't ask him what church he was in or whatever. Follow me. Follow me. Moving on. Chapter 9, verses 10 through 13. And while Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came in and ate with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they asked the disciples, why does is, why is your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? And on hearing this, Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And he's demonstrating this very thing. I've not come to call the righteous. The Pharisees look in and see Jesus having dinner at a tax collector's house. Not just having dinner with a tax collector's house. There's other tax collectors and other sinners up in there. Jesus didn't filter the guest list. He didn't sift through and see, well, this person is of uh, seedy character, so you can't come hang with me. You, I don't like the way you live. You can't come hang with me. And don't think Jesus did not know who these people were. He, he knew exactly who he was eating with. He called, he called Matthew, and then is having dinner at his house later that evening. Not with just Matthew, but with his other tax collector friends, with his other sinner friends. And Jesus answers, For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. We have to remember who we're called here for. As believers, we have to remember why God put us here. We're not here to, to gather believers unto ourselves. We're not here. We're not here for that purpose. Yes, Yes, uh, it is. It is desires. Yes, it is. It is it's quite. It's, it's pleasing. And there's nothing wrong with us having fellowship with other believers. There's nothing wrong with that. He calls us to have that. Do not forsake the gathering. Come together to worship. Come together to hang out. Come together. Come together. There's a there's a purpose in the coming together. But that is not the reason why God called us. The reason why God called us was for sinners. Sinners. Tax collectors, those who murderers, liars, cheaters, people who smell bad. Smell bad is not a sin. Thank God for his wife. Pray for the rest. We don't want to hang out with a burglar, but, but everybody, anybody who needs Jesus, that's who we're called to. That's who we're called to. So Jesus. Verses 14 through 17. 
in John's disciples, and in John the Baptist, to be the forerunner, to play the proclaimer of Christ who is coming. When John's disciples came to him and asked him, how is it that we and the Pharisees fast, and your disciples do not fast? And Jesus answered, come. How can the guests of the bridegroom mourn while the bridegroom is with them? The time will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, then they will No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch will pull away from the garment, making the tear worse. Neither do men pour new wine into old wine skins. If they do, the skins will burst and the wine will run out and the wine skins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wine skins, and the results are preserved. What they realized who Jesus was, and they realized silliness of the question. If you're in the presence of Jesus, if you're in the presence of Jesus, why would you ceremonialize the fast and say, Jesus, I know we're in your presence, but we need to fast. <laughs> no. No. He says, after, after I'm physically gone, and he knew that he would go away, and he knew that the comforter would come, he said, then after I'm gone, after the bridegroom can come no more, is here no more, then they will fast. But see, they were just trying to trip Jesus up. Trying to find something. Trying to find something that they could hang on him. That they could make him guilty for. That they could, that they could use against him. They were trying to do that, the futility of it, the silliness of it. They didn't even realize. He didn't, again, he didn't, he didn't defend himself. He didn't, why are you questioning me? Do you know who I am? I'm tired of you. Why are you always on my back? Why, 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 wherever where I go, why are you always questioning? No, Jesus never does that. He only says, he only, he just answers the question. He just answers the question. So that was the, the distinctions of the disciples. He calls Matthew, he goes and has dinner with Matthew. He's, he, he lets the, the disciples know, even as Matthew is there, that the message for that entire section is that we have to remember why we're here. We're here, we are here. God gave us we, that we might have eternal life so that we could have fellowship and a, an intimate relationship with God, but our purpose is to reach sin to gather together. That doesn't make it off focus or off kilter that we gather together in his name. But God desires that we do that. In his word, Hebrews 13, 4 and 5, do not forsake the gathering. The gathering, we encourage one another. The gathering where we where we share and we get uplifted and and, and as, as, as a people share and one another. All those kind of things. <laughs> we can encourage one another. You don't even have to speak to everybody that's there, but seeing that, you know, this person's here. Oh, so it has its purpose, but it's not the reason. It's not the central reason. You have to remember why you come to Sunday. You have to remember why you come to church. You did not come for the right reason. You came for the same reason. Same reason. Now we get to chapter 9, verses 18 through 34. And as I was reading through this and, and meditating on this, the heading for this is the miracles of restoration. The miracles of restoration. We had the miracles of healing before where the leper was cleansed, the centurion's servant was healed, Peter's mother-in-law was healed. <laughs> Leprosy, a disease, an affliction. The, the, the centurion's servant had a disease, a sickness, an affliction. Peter's mother-in-law had a sickness, had an affliction, okay, that came upon their body and was rendering them uh, sick. The miracle of restoration in chap chapter 9, verses 18 through 24, in uh, 
chapter 9, verse 18 through 26. <laughs> Life is restored. Let's read through that real quick. It says, while he, while Jesus was saying, while he was saying this, a ruler came back and knelt before him and said, my daughter has just died. But come and put your hand on her and she will live. Jesus got up and went with him and so did his disciples. Just then, a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. And she said to herself, if I only touch his cloak, I will be healed. And Jesus turned and saw her. Take heart, daughter. He said, for your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed at that moment. Then Jesus went to the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the noisy crowd, basically the professional mourners, all the mourners there. And he said, go away. The girl is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. <laughs> After that, the crowd had been put outside. He went in and took the girl by the hand, and she got up. News of this spread through all the region. Life was restored. She wasn't sick. <laughs> See, there was no affliction there. There was no, no doctor who could come in and, and, and put a thermometer or uh, one of the heat pads. Nothing. None of that was going to work now. Only Jesus and his power, the power, the power of a king. Only he could come in and change this situation. And on his way to doing that, the woman with the issue of blood, who had the issue of blood for 12 years, her faith healed her because she had the affliction she had used all her money she had done as much as any with all the doctors that they could do they were confounded they were still taking her money still, still trying to help her get healed they were, they were still doing all of that either knowing or unknowing that they, they could not help her but they were still taking her money trying to, trying to help her trying to help her get better but she said this Jesus is coming now her her plight was that if she goes out in public and she's seen in public, she could be stoned because she's unclean. She's not supposed to be out in public. She's not supposed to be out in public. But her faith said, I have to get to Jesus. I have to get to Jesus. This thronging crowd, I'm going to press my way through. I have to get to Jesus. If somebody realizes it's me, they could drag me out and I could get in trouble right away, but I have to get to Jesus. And once she got to Jesus, she didn't stop him and say, you know, if thou wilt, if thou, if thou wilt make me whole. She said, all I have to do, all I need to do, is, all I can do is touch the hem of his garment, touch the hem of his coat. Her faith healed her. Nobody told her, if you go and just touch the hem of his garment, Nobody told her, but she declared for herself, if I can touch the hem of his garment. She said, if, but that's a declaration. If I can just touch the hem of his garment, if I can press through this thronging crowd, if I can touch the hem of his garment, I will be healed. I will be Throwing crowds. He said, Who touched me? No, no, no. Not, not all these people who just bump it up against me. Who, who drained of my virtue? Who put that demand? Who put that demand on me? Daughter, your faith is healed. Her faith. See, that's the beauty of, of it, that we don't have to press through the thronging crowd to get to Jesus. We don't have to risk our, our, our very existence to get to Jesus. All we have to do is call him. All we have to do is get down on our knees. All we have to do is open our mouth. She put more of an effort to get through to Jesus than, 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 than some of us might call him to do. To, 
get to the savior, to get to the healer, to get to the, the to the, the, the to the wow. Amen. <laughs> to get to the deliverer. Because I feel like what what, what the song we sing, God my savior, God my healer, God my deliverer. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Picture her seeing that as she's pressing through the crowd. <laughs> God, my savior. God, my healer. God, my deliverer. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Her faith healed her. Faith healed her. Knowing that she had to get to Jesus. Not to another. Restored life. Restored life to the girl who had died. The man's daughter had died. Because if Jesus, if you just put your hand on her, she will live. If you just put your hand on her, she will live. Death. Death. <coughs> the unconquerable. The unchangeable. The inalterable. Death. But he came and found Jesus and said, if you put your hand on her, she will live. Demonstration of faith. A declaration that he made. Not, oh, master, will you come? Can you heal my child? No, a declaration of faith saying, if you put your hand on her, she will live. And he's just going by what he heard. He's just going by what he heard. Because all the things that Jesus has been doing, the healing miracles, the, 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 the calm in the storm, all those other things, word gets around. Word gets around. Word gets around. Just like word got around and the, the friends brought the paralytic man to Jesus. It's not because they went to Nag Pilot and saw Jesus down there and they found out Jesus was coming here. So, hey, hey, the same Jesus, let's take him here. No. No. They didn't see Jesus on TBN, and he was real dynamic speaker. Hey, Jesus is in the area. Let's bring it to it. No, all they had done was heard. All they had done was hear. All this man had done was hear who Jesus was. If you will come and put your hand on her, she will live. A declaration of faith that overcame death. Death. The ultimate to man. The unchangeable. The woman with Israel's blood had had it for 12 years. Her faith healed her when no doctor could. Her faith healed her. Death. Death is in this man's house. Death. The mourners are there. The musicians are there. Everybody's there. And they are mourning the death. They're acknowledging the death. He is not yielding to death. He's going to Jesus and declaring life. Declaring life. And his declaration is fulfilled. Later on, verse 27 through 31 in chapter 9, a man's sight is, re is, is, is restored. And Jesus heals the blind mute. It says, Jesus went on from there. Two blind men followed him, calling out, Have mercy on us, son of David. And when he had gone indoors, the blind men came to him. And he asked them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? Yes, Lord, they replied. Then he touched their eyes and said, According to your faith, it will be done to you. And their sight was restored. And Jesus warned them sternly, See that no one knows about this. They went out and spread the news anyway. <laughs> all, all, they, and spread the news about him all over the region. <laughs> so, you kind of can't blame them because Jesus has restored their sight, and, and it, it's kind of hard for you know two blind men to go out, go in blind, and come out seeing. It's kind of hard for word not to spread, you know, and, 
day, and there was no news back then. There was no Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, uh, the, uh, any of that other stuff. They didn't have any of that. But two blind men go in blind, and they come out seeing. And yes, the Lord is going to do it. The Lord is going to spread throughout the region. But see, here it is. Again, it requires a declaration. Do you believe that I'm able to do this? Yes, Lord. Not, I think so. I guess so. Well, I hope so. No. Yes, Lord. Yes. And when that song we sing in here, yes. Yes. My soul says yes. Remember that. Remember that. Do you, do you believe that I'm able to do this? Yes, Lord. So we have life restored to a dead little girl. We have sight restored to two blind men. Verses 32 through 34. While they were going out, a man who was demon possessed and could not talk was brought to Jesus. And when the demon was driven out, the man who had been mute spoke and the crowd was amazed and said, nothing like this has ever happened in Israel. But the Pharisees said, God, it is by the prince of demons that he drives out his demons. So back to back to back to back. Jesus, all this stuff is going down. The healings, the, 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 the restoration. Then that's what I love. God is the God of restoration. He didn't heal the blind. He restored his sight. could not speak. The demon passed out and his ability to speak was restored. Miracles of restoration. God is into the miracle of restoration. Yes, he's the God of healing. He, the, mir the miracles of healing will take place. The miracles of power can take place. The miracles of restoration are right up there. Healing. Power and restoration. But what does it take for all of these, for all of these miracles to happen? Something had to be wrong. Somebody had to get sick in order for the miracle, the healing miracle to take place. A storm had to be going on for the miracle of power to manifest itself. An unchangeable condition, that's what I meant, had to exist in order for the miracle of restoration to take place. Miracles only take place in arenas where man can do nothing. Miracles can only take place in an arena where man can do nothing. Where it's impossible for man, but it's possible for God. But if you're waiting for a miracle, if you're waiting for a miracle, if you're praying, hoping, asking God for a miracle, if you want a miracle from God, know that you're going to have to be in a place where you can't do anything. Where you can't do anything but call out to God. Ah, 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 the woman with the issue of blood, no doctor could help her anymore. The only thing she had left was to call out to God. And a miracle took place because of her declaration of faith. This man whose daughter had died and the mourners were in there. He, there was no one else that he could turn to. There was nothing else that he could do. All he could do was go to Jesus and declare, you are able. And the miracle took place. Even with the blind man, they had to declare. Jesus asked them, do you believe? And they had to declare, yes. But when you're in that place, you have to declare the word. You have to declare who God is. You have to declare his ability and desire to do it. And you can't be in that place doubting, fearing, questioning. You can't be in that place lamenting, mourning, crying, hurting. You can't be in that place doing that. Why? Because no miracles are going to happen. No miracles come to those who mourn.
finish out chapter 9, verse 35, and chapter 11, verse 1. Shall I not make the place just for kind purposes? But in chapter 9, verses 5, verse 35 through 38, it discusses the need to delegate. demonstrated all this power. Jesus has demonstrated he's been demonstrating his power. Because remember this section is the power of the king. In part one it was the demonstration of the king's power. He demonstrated it through the miracles of healing. Demonstrated through the miracles of power. Demonstrated it through the miracles of restoration. In the second part demonstration of the king's power. Now, in the second part, you have the delegation of the king's power. And under the delegation of the king's power is the need for the delegation of the king's power. Verses in uh, chapter 9, verses 35 through 38, the need for the delegation of power. His disciples, the, the power that Jesus delegated to them, he gave them power over demons and principalities. He sent them out. He gave them Following the, the delegation of the power, he didn't just give them that power so that and that authority so that they could sit behind a desk and write about it and, 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 and give speeches about it and travel and talk about it. Because in verse chapter 10, verses 1 through 4, Jesus sends the disciples. He sends them out to use the power that's been delegated to them. Nothing God's not wasteful. He's not ceremonial. He's not been fishing for the sake of tradition. Jesus delegated this power. He delegated it to them so that it would be used so God could get the glory. So he delegates the power to them. He sends them out to carry it on. And then in chapter 10, verse 5, through chapter 11, verse 1, Jesus instructs the disciples. Chapter 10, Verse 5 through 11, verse 1. He sends out the 12. And he gives instructions on how they ought to conduct themselves. He gives instructions on what they ought to, to, to bring with them. But basically, he's telling them, you are to rely on God. You are to rely on God. I've given you this power. I've delegated this you don't have to gather up a whole bunch of things to, 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 to try to fortify and certify and, and steady yourself. This is about the kingdom. This is about God. This is about God pursuing the glory. So there's instruction to them. And we're going to read through it um, this week as we, as we begin to go through and prepare for the last section about the delegation of power. There's the need for the power to be delegated. Again, that Jesus did not do it just so that they could sit and be comfortable with all this power. But as soon as he delegates it to them, he sends them out. They never send them out without instructions. So chapter, he gives them really good in-depth instructions in chapter 5 to chapter, chapter 10, verse 5 through chapter 11, verse 1. Next week. of the king's power, and we have the delegation of the king's power. He demonstrated it through the miracles of healing. He demonstrated it through the miracle of restoration. He demonstrated it through the miracles of the power. He demonstrated the power through the miracles of power. All of a sudden,
living for God is to give one's of life. That would be the purpose for which we're created. I was going to quote uh, something that Mother Nature was telling me. That book, Rarely a Revelation, says the best of us is dead. There's one death that we can truly celebrate. <laughs> we may not be able to go out and say, peace be still, and the storm will stop. Unless we absolutely need it to. If we absolutely need it to, and it's necessary, then the storm will stop. When I was stationed in, in Victorville, California, we were having a, a one-day conference, and the forecast called for rain. The see the storm come up over the mountains, got right to where we were, and we could see it moving right around us, <laughs> and we were, 
as we went throughout the day. And we would have our, our, our sessions and we go outside and everyone would be like, well, the storm's coming. When's the storm coming? And we watched it. It came. It got right to the edge where we could see it coming. So that we will have things 